Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together. I'm Joe Kent, Executive Vice President of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, filling in for Keli'i Akina. He's the President and CEO of the Institute. And uh, on Oahu, a new rule allows restaurants and bars to operate under full capacity, but they can only allow guests who have taken their vaccine for COVID-19. So how is this new rule and other lockdown rules. How have these lockdown rules affected Oahu restaurants and bars? Uh, well, today we're talking with Bill Comerford. He's the president of the Hawaii Bar Owners Association, and he owned four Irish-themed bars before the COVID-19 lockdowns, Kelly O'Neill's, Irish Rose Saloon, Anna O'Brien's, and O'Toole. Welcome, Bill. Good afternoon, Joe. How are you? Good, and so nice to have you on the program. Now, I uh, should first ask about your background, but I, I want to talk about these bars, first of all. So you had these four bars, um, and are they still in business? No, they're all gone. Well, I, I, I can't honestly say that in, in good conscience because they're not in my operations anymore. They're beyond me. In other words, uh, I was forced to sell two of them for pennies on the dollar. That would be Kelly O'Neill's and O'Toole's. The landlords around January were forced us to say, hey, you have to open in some way or another. Otherwise, I have to rent it out to somebody else. The other two operations, which were Anna O'Brien's and the Irish Rose Saloon, both had uh, expiring leases in September. And with the, with the conditions that uh, Mayor Caldwell and uh, Governor BK put in, in place, there was no reason to renew those leases. Obviously, you, you could pay a rent and never be open. So, you, so we um, and a lot of other bar owners are in your uh, position too. A lot of bars have gone out of business. So, uh, first, I'm very sorry to hear that. Um, but I do want to go back and just talk about you and your background and what inspired you to even get involved in this business. Well, it's a funny circumstance, but I was raised in uh, Connecticut and Rhode Island. Uh, spent all my school year through in, in Connecticut and uh, spent all my summers in Rhode Island at the beach at a place called Matunic. And uh, I was raised there every summer surfing and all that, and that's, which actually brought me out here. But the matter was that when I was 12 years old, my dad said, hey, you're working. I said, where? He says, across the street. And where's that? At the bar. I was 12 years old. I'm working every day. I was sweeping out the bar, cleaning the, the bathrooms and picking up all the items on the beach. And I laughed because I was paid twenty dollars a week back in 1964 for that, you know. So it was a different time and place, but that's what got me into the business. And uh, though I was a history major in college, I couldn't find myself to be a teacher, so I stepped aside into restaurant management. I've done it across the country, uh, Key West, Florida, Connecticut, and of course I came out here and uh, chose to be in the position of being a bartender as opposed to being a, a owner and manager. You know? I it's see. It's been a good time. For me, you know? That's great. And, and I know a lot of uh, people in the community really love uh, the bars that you started. And uh, what do you think, first of all, the, the bars mean to the community, uh, your bars? Well, I'm guilty of one thing, that, and that's why I'm closed. I'm guilty of the fact that I gather people. I gather people together. I do things that, you know, live music and dancing every night. Uh, every bar is actually a community living room. People gather to meet their friends there. They have a place that they can meet, they can talk and go home. And it's been something that I've done. And it's something I've really enjoyed. And I, I like the Irish theme. I've also been involved with the Friends of St. Patrick. I was the president of the organization. Turned it around from a, 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 a how would I say, a group that was about to step into the, step into the grave and turn it around and turn it into an operating op operation. That's a club, that's a society that people like to meet. And once again, we do the St. Patrick's Day Parade, the, the big block party downtown. We do Celtic Days of Honolulu, which both Mayor Caldwell and Governor Ige signed off on for five to six years, where we had two mm -hmm. months of Celtic events that we brought and golf training, concerts, everything. So, And, yeah. and uh, St. Patrick's Day, uh, in 2020 was quite an event. Uh, I believe that was around the time that the first big lockdown order came down. Uh, do you remember that time and how did that go? That was the last day of real business that we did in, in everything. And uh, of course, at that time, they said, we're going to close you. And they hadn't made up their mind whether they were closing us. 
we, they canceled the parade, they canceled the block party downtown, and we were just looking at, can we survive this? So hold on one second, I hear something, I just hear something I have to turn down. Okay, well, while he goes uh, fix and fixes that, I do want to move our attention to today. Sure. And today's in today's um, uh, new rules, Honolulu bars and restaurants can operate under limited capacity. Um, but if they want to operate under full capacity, they can do so as long as they only allow customers that have been vaccinated. So what are bar owners and restaurants saying about this? I think they're mostly perplexed. What can we do? In other words, government once again has taken a rule in, in an effort to try to say, okay, we'll throw you some crumbs. You figure it out. Because it, it's, it's got a lot of questions to this. I mean, there's civil rights questions, there's employee questions, there's customer questions, there's compliance questions. Would you, will you be uh, fined or, or sued for something you do? Nobody knows. It's just, you know, they throw us a bone and said, hey, you can figure it out, go do it. And what are, um, it, are there concerns about what customers may, or, or on social media, what they may see, uh, you know, talk about with the bar? If, if you allow certain customers and disallow other customers, are, are there concerns about what customers might say? I think anybody in the business is just trying to find a way to be open. And that's the key, because quite honestly, uh, the mayor called well and uh, Ike never gave us a chance to survive. And last year, they closed us on March, uh, March 18th, said we would be closed for two weeks. We were closed until June, June 19th. They let us come back just to renew our liquor licenses because every, every license has to be renewed on June 30th. So we renewed our liquor licenses and then they closed us on July 30th. And they said, we'll close you for three weeks while we train those uh, liquor inspectors. That long three weeks lasted all the way until uh, March, of, uh, March 13th of 2021. I don't think that's three weeks. I don't think they can tell time. So anyways, they, they closed us and there was no means to survive. We had no funds from the CARES Act. We had no funds from, uh, uh, how do I say, the PPP. I no. had PPP last April and again this April. That's a full year apart. So you're saying that uh, many bar owners, you did receive some aid. I'm sorry, you did receive what? Some, uh, some federal or state aid. But we, uh, what well, we did, well, the, the first PPP was understandable, but I was gone by June 30th of last year. And the last dollar of sales I had was on July 30th when um, Caldwell closed us for three weeks. Mm -hmm. In other words, I had no income at all from July 30th until I received the uh, PPP in, in the late April of this year. I couldn't keep, if I had money, I, I would have been able to possibly keep two of my bars because I would have had some means, but I had no means to, to pay any rent or pay any back rent or do anything. Now, have, have other bars uh, also been in your position, in this position too? Very much so. Very much so. Uh, we have people who've been in the business for 20 to 30 years with their, with their, they've been my age. I'm 68 years old. I'll be 69 in October. I'm at the age of retirement. And what you're, what they were forced to do is take their retirement funds and try to preserve their business. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it fails or it closes, now you don't even have any money for retirement. And that's the position I've been in. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very serious. I applied for what was called the shuttered venues grant, or went through the process of that. But if you applied for that, you could not get, you could not apply for the PPP at the same time. So you had no funding. And they extended it for, it was supposed to be in early January. It never got approved until sometime in May. And then they said, okay, in late, April, late March, they said, well, you can apply for PPP now. Also, I had the CARES Act, I had some CARES Act money from the city and county, but the city and county had I had the bad experience of saying, "Go pay your bills and we'll reimburse you." I only had a hundred fifty thousand dollar EIDL loan, and with that EIDL loan, I paid a hundred thousand dollars in bills, and they decided to give me twenty thousand dollars for it. Hmm. I said, "That's not what you said you'd do. You said you would reimburse our bills, and you didn't." So, so the I money didn't was money out of them until until after uh, when they had the closure of the CARES Act. They gave so the, us some funds at that stage, you know. Now the we money was a, a little that. bit uh, too little, too late, you might say. Well, it, right? here's the point: it was not income. It, you paid your bills, and they said we'll reimburse you if you pay your bills. I said this mm -hmm. is still not income. 
There's no need to go forward with it. All you're now, doing is paying off past debt. Now, did you see some, um, uh, let's say, unfairness or, or unequal treatment between bars and other establishments during the lockdowns? Very much so. I mean, uh, Mayor Colbo made up his rules as he went along. There's no such uh, rule or law in the, in the in how they say, in Honolulu uh, liquor law, uh, state liquor law, I should say, in Honolulu City and County rules for the Liquor Commission. He made them up as he went along. He called about nightclubs. There's no such thing as a nightclub in Hawaii. There's cabarets, different licensing. So he was going based on what people were saying on the mainland as opposed to what was happening here. And he never had a conversation with anybody in the, in the industry to properly discuss it. He just made it up as he went along. And I had a food establishment permit. I had, uh, I had the passing grade for the blue, uh, green card that you have on the windows for all of my bars. And I, I opened up and sold hot dogs. He says, you can't do that. You have to sell 30% food. Something he oh, made up. Oh, I see. I see. So even though I could have served food, I was very much targeted by, by the mayor. You know? And he said, well, we're going to get you out of here. And so they did. They closed us. And anybody that had no kitchen at that point was put to death. Your business is going down because you don't well, have a kitchen. You know? What about people who say, yes, but we need people to be safe and, and there are rules for uh, allowing restaurants and bars uh, to operate um, at, at least somewhat. Um, and eventually we'll get there, but we just need to wait it out. And what, what about these types of uh, thoughts? I think uh, if you take a look at it, and this was part of the conflict of what uh, Mayor Caldwell did was he, he decided what bars were. And right immediately, he had two or three different cases where bars that he decided were restaurants because they had a kitchen, had COVID cases. So he called them up, now he started calling them a bar again now, after he decided they were restaurants because they had kitchens. So it was his, once again, his determination. And what happened with us is that we had, a, a, I should say, an anonymous complaint against our bar and our neighbor next to us, where a gentleman came in, would not get his uh, temperature taken, wouldn't wear a mask, wouldn't observe the six foot distancing, so we told him he had to leave. In doing so, apparently he made a complaint. Now, I've never seen the source of the complaint, never seen I the see. complaint, even though I requested it, but I had uh, health inspectors, liquor inspectors, and police officers in my bar for two weeks straight. And all of them said, you guys are doing a great job. You're doing a better job than anybody else I see out there. What, what was the rationale? What was the rationale be that um, bars had different rules than restaurants before? Um, was it just totally arbitrary or was there at least some theoretical well, there, rationale? There is within the rules of the Liquor Commission, you can have a rep, you can have a general dispenser license. My bars are most I have three bars of the general dispenser licenses, and they have the uh, ability to have uh, uh, what was it live entertainment and entertainment and dancing, okay? So you could have music and you could have okay. live dancing. So it's still the same kind of license. It's a general dispenser license. You have general dispenser license that uh, uh, say that you're gonna have at least 30% food and you're taxed on a different level on that basis. And on that basis, you would still have a general, general dispenser license and it would be called a restaurant license, but you had to do 30% plus more in food or pay, or pay a penalty if you did less than so this I is see. something that the mayor kind of made up as he went along, I see. right? Mm -hmm. So it has, it has some semblance of, 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 how would I say, that you're looking at the rules and seeing something, but you're not reading the rules. You're just picking things out of the rules to make it your way. You know? uh, what about also this, this rule that restaurants, bars, and social establishments uh, are only allowed to serve alcohol before midnight and, the, and they can't serve it after midnight, the sort of alcohol curfew rule. Um, did that hurt your business too? Very much so. Because remember, it only went to midnight in, uh, what would we say, March 13th of this year when Mayor, Co Mayor Blanchiardi made that move. Prior to that, we were closed at 10 o'clock. You'd only served at 10 o'clock. So, let me give you an example. Kelly O'Neill's, right? Right now is open as much as they can possibly be. They're a four o'clock license. They're a cabaret license. Most of my business was always done between 11 o'clock at night and three o'clock in the morning. I could do more in those hours than I would do in a, in a bar, other bar for the whole week. 
And what happens is they, they deny that process. You don't have the entertainment. You have restrictions of capacity. You have restrictions of hours. And get, what's that mean? It means where you're paying rent of close to $25,000 a month, you have to do some sales. And you can't do those sales because you're limited. So currently, uh, they're probably doing maybe uh, maybe uh, 45, 40 to fifty percent of what they would normally do in sales over there, with the loss of hours and the and the minimum capacities that they're allowed. I see. So now, do you think that um, bars? right now, even under this, these 50% uh, capacity and, and the current limitations and everything, can bars operate safely? Yes. If, if the restaurants are uh, operating safely, bars can too. But we have to say something here, and I apologize for this, but you know what? We are convicted of one thing. All of our bars were put out of business primarily because they had the potential to gather people. Not that they were gathering people. They had the potential to gather, and they had like a, a hearing between uh, your health uh, your health administrators, your government administrators, and the mayor, and you decide what you're going to do. And those people said, "You know what? Let me ask you this, Joe. I'm going to guess that you're probably a nine to five guy, aren't you? Yeah. And guess what? All right. those people are nine to five people. And in their world, they say nobody should be out at midnight. Nothing good happens after midnight. But they don't I realize see. that." Who, who works the midnight? Hospital workers, uh, ambulance drivers, the police, um, everybody in hotels and restaurants, they're all working to midnight or to closing time. And when they get off work, what do they wanna do? They wanna have a drink. Well, we're gonna come back uh, after this break, take a short break and we'll be back with Bill to talk about uh, more about the rules. So stay with us. Aloha, I'm Mitch Ewan, host of Hawaii, the state of clean energy on ThinkTech Hawaii. Hawaii, the state of clean energy is about following the many clean energy initiatives in Hawaii. Hawaii, the state of clean energy appears weekly on ThinkTech Hawaii at 4 p.m. on Wednesdays. Thank you so much for watching our show. We'll see you then, aloha. Aloha again, and welcome to Hawaii Together. Uh, I'm Joe Kent, filling in for Kaylee Iakina uh, with the Grassroots Institute of Hawaii. And today we're talking about bars in Honolulu and the new rules and the old rules and all the bars that have uh, shut down. Now, I've talked to uh, many bar owners who have been shut down. Some have left to the mainland and, uh, and many have struggled under um, the, the rules that have basically said um, that it, bars cannot uh, open uh, for certain times of the day or under certain restrictions. So uh, today we have Bill Comerford um, and he's the owner of four Irish themed bars. Uh, welcome back, Bill. The past owner of four Irish. Past owner, I should say. Can I ask you, did, do you have plans to open any of the bars again? Um, I've been approached by uh, one landlord in a property that was gone. You know, the lease was expired last September. And somebody else took over the, uh, the property, offered us a, a lease because of the fact that we have, how they say, we have the liquor license still in, in place. You know? Liquor license lasts the whole year and you have to have a million dollar policy of insurance for it. So it was very costly. But he, he asked me to come back and I'm looking at it and I said, if I get that whole money, I will. And that's what I'm doing now. I've also been approached maybe over at Ann O'Brien's, but Ann O'Brien's is inundated with homeless. The whole mm -hmm. park across the street in Moeili is a campground for the homeless. Mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not a good prospect to try to go over and open. But so the bar that you're um, thinking of opening is the Irish Rose Saloon, a reopening. Yes, yes. Is that right? Like you, uh, on Ana Road, yeah. So. I see. And is that the one that you started um, with in Honolulu? Well, we did. Uh, we started actually on Luber Street. Uh, four, seven, uh, we had uh, 227 Lure Street is where we originally originated. 
and it was owned, it was owned by a, a Lane and Jim. And that's why we have, why we have a corporation known as E&J Long Jump. They were the, the principals in that organization. And uh, they retired around 1998, and that's when we took over. So that's I why see. we continued it. We actually uh, applied over at the uh, Island Colony. And that's how we formed the Hawaii Bar Owners Association, because I was denied the license there. And actually uh, went forward to the uh, state Supreme Court and won. Right now, we reopened the license, but it was not possible. What do you think about uh, your prospects for reopening? I mean, we've still, we're still under um, many rules and um, still questions about whether we can reach, a, you know, the, the right percentage of vaccines in Honolulu and Hawaii to, to reopen everything. So what is your prospects for the future? I, very minimal. I would say uh, the prospects of being successful are virtually small because of the fact that I'm gonna pay high rents. I can pay my, pay my employees if I can get them back. It's been a hard time trying to get employees back. I could pay my, uh, I could pay my rents, which are gonna be high for the landlord's sake. And I can pay my taxes for government. That's it, that it's pretty much ignored us in this situation. I've been taxed very heavily and had zero representation. So coming back to all this, I said, why would I stay? And the only reason I'm gonna stay is because I got a federal grant that I'm allowed to pay off my debt. So I'll, I'll pay off my debt and have very minimal, very little chance of going forward. The bars will not probably be in a very profitable position, but it'll give me the means to try to uh, pay off my past debt and try to move forward. And I, I had an interesting question upon receiving this. I asked uh, the head of the SBA in the region. I said, uh, "Can I take this debt? Can I take this grant with me to a place that's open?" And he said, "Yes, you can. It's not limited to why." So I could take oh, I the see. whole grant and move somewhere else and actually start a whole new business all over. Do you, find that, that? Do you find that other bar owners are doing that? I don't think anybody got, I, I don't think very few qualified for this grant. You know? I see, I see. I think very few qualified for it. I have, I have some friends that I know uh, got the, uh, the shuttered venues grant and have been able to reopen because of that. Mm -hmm. and, and that had some very, um, mysti how do I say, mystifying rules. I had live music every night in all my bars, but I didn't have a, uh, a cover charge all the time, so I didn't qualify. I didn't have a uh, fixed seating like a theater or loge seat, so I didn't qualify for that. But it well, kept me out even of if, money for a long time. Even if we um, uh, move to tier, well, we are in tier five, but if we operate under the social establishment rules, um, let's let's say that um, lots mm -hmm. of people get vaccinated and we. Um, you know, bar owners, restaurants decide to check to see and only allow those guests that have been vaccinated and so on. So they can operate at full capacity. Um, but bars would still not be able to open or serve alcohol after midnight, though. That's right. And there's still questions about musicians and, and so on. Right. So right. it's and, and the rules themselves are confusing. And then you have tourists coming from the mainland who may or may not be vaccinated and and so on. So it's we're, we're not out of the woods yet, even under uh, the by best. of mm -hmm. Not by any means. Quite honestly, I, you know, when we were in the tier system, I told people that bars were in tier five. They said, there's no tier five. I said, read tier four. Because when you get to tier four and you get to the bars, it said TBD, to be determined. We're still in that, we're still in that place. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, bars are in tier 13. They're in tier 13. We're the first to be closed, last to reopen. Mm. Why? Because they, uh, the government is totally prejudicing it against us. They are. They love, they love to tax us. <laughs> they love the taxes because they get a huge, they make more money on every beer sold than I, I could possibly. You know? I make uh, five to 10 cents on a, a $5 beer. They're probably going to make $1.25. You know? So it goes I that see. way. But That's... I don't think that the uh, governor will ever release his powers until he leaves office. Mm -hmm. My grant lasts until uh, 2000, um, March of 2023. He'll leave office in January of 2023. Will we ever open? I asked uh, have you, Eric Caldwell, and he never opened this. You know? ha have you talked to uh, Mayor Blangiardi at all about uh, any I have, suggestions? I have talked to Mr. Uh, Mr. Blangiardi, and I have great appreciation for him. I've also talked with uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green, and I have appreciation for him because I feel he's done his job for what he's trying to do. But I can honestly say, in a 
it's been uh, a year and a half now almost since they closed us in March of 2020. The governor's office has never replied to a single phone call, a single email, a single letter, or anything to us to have a meeting, ever, ever. When I called them last, uh, two weeks ago, when, before I signed a new lease, I said, I want to know what the rules are going to be. They said, well, I said, I'd like to talk to somebody in your office. She you cannot. They said, you could write to the governor. I said, you mean by the website? Like I just, like I have 30 to 40 times. And they hung up on me. I see. It's hard to get through. Um, they, they, the time, they it's hard to get the anything. time of day, might, you might say, yeah. right. Well, what about um, going back to before we leave the the vaccine yeah. uh, rules and everything? Yeah. Um, is your position on that that well, we just kind of if it's the only way to make it work, then let's do it? Um, or is there another way to view this? No, I, I do see that's the only way they're going to let you open. But it, even still, if they're going to let you open, let you please open the hours that we have to that we pay for. The full hours. I've paid, for, I've paid for three liquor licenses I haven't been able to use. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. You know? I mean, the governor makes the rules. It's a law. It's as good as a law. And he won't talk to anybody. Basically, what they have done is they chose to ignore us. They, they sentenced us to death without due process, without a hearing, without any conversation, without accepting any phone calls, and, and chose for us to ignore you to death. And they still ignore us to death. Well, Bill, is there any other final thoughts that you have? I know you have a lot of thoughts about this and passionate ones. Well, I'm, I'm thankful that I, if I, I want to thank uh, our uh, Mr. Case's office for helping us to get through this grant program. Because it was without that, I would be totally a million dollars in debt and crying myself to sleep every night. But fortunately, I, I've relieved my debt with, through this process. Whether I can have, create a successful business to sell or operate, it's questionable, but at least I relieved my debt, and that's huge. And can I help Hawaii? Not like I used to, because like I said, I still want to gather people. What is Oahu known as? It's the gathering place. What did I do? I gathered people, and that's my that's I my see. my guilt, you know, apparently. You know? Well, thank you, Bill, for coming on the show and talking with us. And thank you for everything you're doing and best wishes for your future ventures. Uh, I know it's uh, very difficult, but uh, best wishes nonetheless. Um, and uh, thanks for tuning in to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcasting Network. I'm Joe Kent uh, signing off.